fun time. Our first speaker is Thomas Keane from the European Bioinformatics Institute to talk about uh, data standards and global variant databases. Okay, great. Um, just uh, thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this meeting. I mean, it's a really impressive uh, uh, lineup, and it's quite a unique gathering. I think of uh, you know kind of global leaders in uh, in this this new world of these million millions of genome sequences and trying to make the the best use of those. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, switch gears a little bit, and uh, I'm not going to show any actual data in my talk. I'm going to talk about how do we make make things interoperable? How do we make access to these huge uh, these millions of genomes that are coming? Uh, and how do we make them available to re for researchers, for clinicians, uh, and all the kind of data standards that need to happen sort of, you know, underneath uh, at that. Um, I'm going to focus quite a lot of my talk um, um, on the Global Alliance in Genomics and Health. It's a, a group that I'm quite heavily involved in, and uh, uh, at EMBL EBI, we're uh, uh, one of the uh, kind of key partners for that group. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about data standards and global, but maybe less so on the variant database part. Okay, so um, if you just look at some of the uh, some of the genomic standards that exist, there are lots of standards out there. Uh, you could take your pick uh, uh, on which one you you, you want to use. Uh, you know, some just some of them that are available. Uh, you know, the from the HL7 group, the the uh, fire standard uh, for um, 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 exchange of healthcare information, I guess, is, is largely uh, have come out from the US uh, system. Uh, the, the, interestingly, the, uh, the MPEG group, the Moving Picture Expert group, the people who, who make uh, uh, movie standards, uh, they're also involved in, in developing a, a, a standard for uh, uh, representing and uh, exchanging uh, genome information. Um, but the group I'm going to talk about, focus the rest of my talk on, is the, is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And, uh, uh, you know, in particular, you know, this, is, this, this group has got representation from all over the world. Um, I think. That is kind of reflected in, in the membership for the GA4GH uh, organization. You know, we've got over 2,000 subscribers, uh, over 500 uh, organizational members. Uh, there's representation from approximately 70 countries. So, you know, it's as, it, it is as global a, an organization as you can get for genome standards. Uh, and kind of interestingly, there's, um, you know, the, the groups, that, the organizations and, and, and subscribers that we have, we've got quite a good representation from, you know, life science and informa information technology companies make up about 40 percent. You know, obviously universities and research centers make another substantial proportion, I think about 40 percent again. You know, we've got academic medical centers, uh, disease advocacy groups, uh, various consortia, you know, and funders and, and different uh, uh, associated agencies make up uh, um, the, the rest. So I think it's, it's probably, in terms of uh, global standards, maybe it's one of the, the groups that's got the most sort of traction and that has in, in due to, uh, to know, um, the, the efforts of our, our uh, leadership over the last few years. Uh, the current chair is, uh, is Ewan, Ewan Bernie, who needs no uh, introduction. Uh, we've got our, our CEO is, uh, uh, in the audience here, Peter Goodhand, uh, and, and our vice chairs, David Hauser and, and Catherine uh, North. I mean, the mission is quite simple. Um, you know, we want to uh, accelerate progress in, in genome science and human health, you know, by developing standards and framing policy for responsible, responsible genomic and health-related uh, data sharing. But that is in, in, in no small challenge. So where do we want to get to, um, you know, in the, in the, the time frame of the next maybe five to 10 to, to 20 years to try and keep up with the, uh, the volume of genomic data that's being generated? Um, you know, if you think of maybe a, a, a clinical geneticist, a, a clinician, maybe that's working in rare disease, a, a researcher working in common disease that's uh, studying a particular, uh, um, uh, doing a, a GWAS, ever larger GWAS analysis for a particular, t a particular disease type, you know, you've got maybe have available, you know there is a, uh, maybe a few hundred or a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of uh, samples available in your own local institute. Um, you know that there are cohorts out there and somewhere in the world um, that are, are, you know, you want to be able to do some comparative analysis uh, against. Um, maybe they, they, are, they, they have, are studying the same disease type, uh, the same traits. Um, those data sets, you know, one, they're too large to be, to be physically moved. Two, there could be jurisdictional restrictions where they, they actually can't leave the particular uh, um, uh, jurisdiction that they were generated in. There could be incre increased security requirements. That means that the data can't be transferred to your local institute. Um, you know, and what we want to enable is, is to enable uh, uh, comparative analysis, maybe um, in rare disease, you want to be able to find, uh, um, look up by genotype, by phenotype, 
um, you know, to find matched cases uh, for common disease. You know, you might you want to do a, a GWAS of, of a million, two million, you know, 10, 100 million uh, uh, individuals. Um, but to be able to do that, you know, um, as I was saying, the data is not going to be moved, you know, just due, due to the reasons I discussed. Um, so you need to be able to log into those infrastructures and bring your analysis to the data. And that's the, one of the key changes, the mindset changes that we, we're going through at the moment is uh, we need to be, our analysis needs to be portable to go to where the data is. Um, so um, one of my colleagues, uh, Benedict Payton, uh, uh, wrote this nice blog, nice, uh, blog post uh, a few months ago to try and kind of frame this a little bit better. Um, he talked about this data biosphere and, and colleagues, so other colleagues from the GA4GH group uh, talked about this data biosphere for biomedical research and you know, tried to break, break this challenge down into the individual units that need to be um, uh, uh, developed and standards that need to be developed over the next uh, coming years. Uh, you know, thinking of, uh, of um, things like um, search, finding data sets, data discovery, um, you know, how to make your analysis uh, portable to different, uh, to, where t to go to where the data is located, uh, to have sort of tool repositories, standard analysis pipelines that you could draw upon, you know, uh, how do you, how do you um, uh, present your data sets, how do you make them uh, uh, available over standardized APIs that then tools can then interoperate with, you know, and, the, and they, they frame some kind of some sort of principles that we need for, um, to address this challenge. So, you know, they're kind of, some of them are kind of obvious. It needs to be community driven. It needs to be open source. It needs to be standard based to ensure interoperability across all these different cohorts that are um, um, coming. Uh, and it needs to be modular so that there are functional components. Um, so, you know, this, this kind of comes back to sort of the, the core mantra for the GA4GH group is that we want you know, we want to standardize on the interfaces for accessing and sharing the data, but we want to be enable, uh, you know, uh, uh, really smart researchers to develop uh, re even better algorithms, for, you know, for better and faster and more accurate algorithms for analyzing the data. Um, we want to enable, you know, IT companies out there to uh, come up with more, more uh, compressed and faster ways to st and better ways to store the data, uh, given the challenges that we're facing. But we want to just standardize on the interfaces of how we exchange the data, and that's kind of one of our core sort of mantras for GA4GH. Um, so we had a little bit of a, a reorganization last year uh, with, with Ewan, Ewan taking over as the uh, chair of the, of the group. Um, we now broke, the, the way we're organized is more like a matrix structure. Uh, we have a, a number of technical work streams uh, there uh, and, and two foundational work streams. Uh, the technical work streams are data discovery. I mean, you could nearly, you, you know, it's kind of obvious what the net work stream should be based on, you know, you could look at the diagram that I showed a, a few slides ago. Uh, data discovery, how do you find the relevant data sets? Uh, large scale genomics, how do we store and exchange these uh, uh, large volumes of data? Uh, data use and researcher IDs. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The, cl uh, the cloud work stream, how do we, how do we analyze the data in, given that it's going to be stored in, uh, in, the, in, the, in all these different uh, cloud infrastructures around the world? Uh, genome knowledge standards, yeah, how do we represent some of the things like you know, representing uh, a genetic variation and annotating genetic variation? Uh, and the clinical and phenotypic data capture, so how do we inter interface with the, uh, the clinical and uh, phenotype data capture uh, uh, world? And, and then, of course, we've got our two foundational work streams, the uh, regulatory ethics and data security, and they've, they've been in existence since the very start of the, uh, the GA4GH. Um, but the one change that we did, uh, we did go through is that, you know, we kind of realized that we need, we need to have a, a sort of, um, you know, high communication and kind of high involvement with, uh, with some real world driver projects, um, you know, who are actually trying to face these, who are facing these kind of challenges and trying to build these systems. So, so essentially the, the cohorts and the projects that are, that, that are being represented in this room, uh, we, need to, we need to have those at the table so we can actually, you know, learn what, what are their challenges and how are they approaching it and, and actually get them to, to get involved in defining these standards. Um, because, you know, this is still a, it's a, a, a very fast moving area. Um, so we identified a whole set of uh, uh, driver projects. Um, I'll show these in a second. Uh, they, they kind of identified, uh, you know, which of, the, uh, which of these technical work streams they were most interested in. Uh, they make up then the membership of the work streams, the people who come to the, 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 um, the meetings week in, week out, you know, and actually drive these standards forward and do the kind of, interop the kind of more boring sort of work of just showing interoperability across these different uh, um, um, uh, federated cohorts. Um, we have, uh, we identified 14, I think it's 14, yeah, 14 driver projects in 2017. These were, uh, this, this was all kind of launched at the, uh, the um, just at, the, at our plenary meeting, just uh, before the ASHG meeting last uh, October. Um, there's 
I, I think that in this room alone, we probably have representation from several of, of these uh, uh, groups. You know, and I think you know, being a driver project means that you know, you're signing up to actually getting involved in the kind of nuts and bolts of defining the standards of, of, you know, of you're going to dedicate, you need to be you're kind of dedicating some of your, your leadership time, some of your, your developers' time, some of your uh, engineers' time uh, to push forward on these standards that we have to, uh, we have to develop over, you know, quite, quite soon. Um, to, to get the best, the, the, the most value from the uh, um, genet uh, genetic and genomic data that's being generated. Um, so I'll just, for the next couple of slides, I'll just um, go walk through some of the, uh, the work streams and just at a high level define sort of what, what are the kind of areas that they're working in. Um, so the data use and researcher ID work stream, uh, you know, they're really kind of looking at the kind of two different accesses of, uh, of, of control of data. You know, one is uh, data use, so what kind of research, you know, what, what can you do with the data um, given the, 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 the consent agreements that were signed by the participants maybe uh, for those particular uh, research studies. Um, you know, there is a lot of work happening in this area of data use. Uh, you know, one of the exciting things is that there is the emergence of this data use ontology, which is being able, which will mean that we can, you know, in a kind of machine readable way, you know, figure out, you know, what, 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 what um, in the consent agreements, what, what is the, uh, um, um, the, the, how can this data be used and for what types of research can it be used for? And uh, this whole operation of mapping consent agreements onto this data use ontology is, a, is, is quite a, uh, an exciting area and actually, you know, will enable, you know, better and faster uh, uh, sharing of data. Um, the other side of it, again, of course, is the author authentication and authorization uh, infrastructure. Um, so this again is a researcher comes along to a to a, 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 a another um, a cohort, another repository, and says, "Who are you?" Uh, the the, um, the um, uh, cohort will you know ask, "Who are you? What are your what are your credentials?" Uh, and there are a whole set of different standards for doing that. Most okay, most of them involve sending emails around and, and uh, bits of paper and, and scanning bits of paper, which is really unfortunate. But but I think you know we're moving to an uh, to a world where we're going to have kind of interoperable uh, AI infrastructures, and there's already that's already happening. And maybe in uh, just in Europe alone, the uh, the Elixir group are quite active in this area of trying to get sort of uh, pan-European uh, um, um, interoperable um, authentication and authorization systems. Uh, the cloud work stream is a is an extremely active uh, uh, work stream. Uh, we know that there is, you know, the genomic data is is being stored in in, in different clouds around the world. Uh, you know, we've got quite a good uh, representation in this group from the some of the major cloud providers. Uh, um, you know, like the the kind of Google, the Amazon, the uh, Microsofts. Um, uh, and I think, you know, we kind of realized that to be able to bring your, to, to be able to make your, your analysis portable and bring it to, to where the data is located, you know, there's a whole set of kind of standardized interfaces and services that, that are required, uh, you know, like, you know, to be able to define your genomic uh, um, workflow, you know, to be able to do a GWAS in a, in a remote uh, data set, you know, you need to be able to define your, your workflow in a, in a common workflow language. Uh, you need to be able to, the data needs to be presented in a standardized kind of way with a standardized set of interfaces. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole stack of, of things. And this, this, this is probably, you know, is probably one of the most active uh, uh, groups in the, uh, in the GA4G8 at the moment. Um, the discovery work stream. So, again, this work stream is kind of obvious from the name. Uh, you know, how do you find the data sets that, that, that are, are, are of interest to you? Uh, you know, you can think of by looking up by genotype, by phenotype, by data use, uh, are the three kind of, uh, um, um, you know, most prevalent ways of, of finding data sets of interest. Um, you know, one of the initiatives that this group has had, has been running for quite a few years, is the, um, the Beacon Network. I think they've got, you know, approximately, I think there's a, over 90 beacons have been, uh, have been created. So this is where you can do uh, uh, genotype lookups by just sending like a, an allele uh, and a position on the genome and just saying is, have you got any evidence for this? Uh, it's been extended to be, to be uh, so that you can get more rich results back and, and you can also, uh, there is some, some aspect of controlled access uh, if you want to get more information, but there's a handoff then to, so this is where you, you find the data sets of interest for the, um, um, but by the different, uh, uh, by genotype. Uh, the Matchmaker Exchange uh, is, uh, has also been running for quite a few years. Uh, this is, uh, you know, correspond the kind of opposite to the, uh, to, to, to the beacon is, you know, where you, where you want to find uh, uh, samples by phenotype, so you're looking up by disease type, by trait. Um, and again, I think the, the matchmaker has got, you know, maybe some on the order of something like 20 uh, different nodes that, have, uh, that are part of this network. Okay, uh, the genome knowledge standards work stream. Uh, this, 
Workstream initially is, uh, is focusing on variant representations. How do we represent genetic variation uh, in, a, in standardized uh, uh, models? Uh, um, um, and then and also the corresponding, uh, um, how do we annotate variants? So how do we annotate the, uh, the, the functional effects of the, of the variants uh, and their evidence and their provenance? Um, and I think this, this group has folded in some of the work from the Variant Modeling Consortium that's been running for a few years. Um, and some of their timelines are listed here. Uh, the clinical and phenotyp phenotypic data capture uh, work stream, uh, they, you know, they're, they're kind of focusing on the interface between, uh, between um, the GA4GH and, and the sort of clinical world and the phenotypes. Um, so they're focusing on three different subgroups as data representation, uh, data exchange, and then implementation, education, and engagement. Um, I think, you know, the, the, um, this is kind of where we'll have kind of the interface between the EHR uh, infrastructure and standards and, and the GA4GH, uh, which is probably one of the most challenging uh, areas. Um, uh, and then finally, the, uh, the work stream that I co-lead with, uh, with my colleague Oliver Hoffman uh, is the large-scale genomics work stream. So, you know, we're really focused on, you know, creating standardized methods for accessing large-scale uh, large genomic data by file-based, API-based, cloud-based, and distributed access. You know, this is really at the kind of nuts and bolts of, uh, of um, you know, when you get your sequencing data off the machine, you know, to how you, uh, how you analyze it, how you store it, then how you send it to your colleague to, to, uh, um, to, to interpret. You know, and then how you how do you go all, all the way through then to uh, to feeding back the results into uh, clinical reports? So you know we've got in this group we've got some uh, some quite a diverse set of uh, key stakeholders. You know we're talking to the platform vendors out there, uh, clinical genomics platforms, uh, genome sequencing providers. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a whole community of bioinformatics developers. Uh, you know out there who we we, we kind of need them to implement some of the, um, some of the standards that we're working on. So uh, academic sequencing centers um, and. I guess it kind of comes back to, uh, you know, so one of the things, one of the areas that we work in is that we, we do maintain some of the specifications for some of the, uh, the sequencing formats. Um, you know, and it kind of, it kind of comes back to, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of having these driver projects. You know, some of the sequencing form, the data formats that we use for NGS data, you know, they, some of them came out, are, are legacies of the Thousand Genomes Project. Uh, I, I put up an email here that Richard Durfin sent to the, uh, the Thousand Genomes Analysis List in 2009 where, you know, he was essentially what he's talking about is, is what we call the VCS standard, the Variant Call Format Standard, which we all use and are still using every day, uh, where he's talking about trying to use it in his, in, in, uh, for analyzing some Thousand Genomes data. So, you know, for the GA4GH, you know, what we, you know, what we really have to get is, is this involvement from the driver projects, the, the groups who are, who are here in this room. Uh, to be able to build these standards because it's, uh, it's only by implementing them that we find out if they work or not. Um, yeah, so some of the standards, we, we maintain the, uh, the, the, the SAM and BAM format uh, for uh, storing our sequencing reads, the VCF and BCF, you know, and these formats are changing. The, we, we launched the CRAM format uh, just uh, in 2016. This immediately gets you a 40% uh, disk space saving without any loss of information for over the SAM and BAM format. You know, it's a, it's a key kind of uh, advance on from where, you know, if we're going to meet the challenges of the increasing data volumes. Um, and we, we interact with a, a whole community of bioinformatics developers. Um, we have to bring those with us. We can't, we can't just change these formats around because there's so much investment in, in, in large-scale pipelines in these formats. Um, okay, I'll skip that. So one thing that we did uh, um, launch, you know, we're trying to, you know, we want to enable groups to innovate, um, you know, in, in how they, you know, at the back end, in the, we want to en enable IT companies to be able to come up with smarter ways to represent the data, smarter ways, you know, more compressed ways, more faster ways to, uh, to store it, to serve it. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is to move away from assuming that there's always a file. Um, what, one of the standards that we launched just uh, at, the start, at the end of last year was uh, this standard called the HTS GET format. It's a, it's a standard basically uh, for, um, for how you present uh, sequencing reads and, and, and variants and how you can then securely stream those, you know, maybe if you're working within the cloud infrastructure or if you want to put, you know, you want to stream data from one cloud to another cloud, um, you know, how you can kind of do that. And it builds on the kind of current standards that we have, but actually moves us away from the assumption that you're storing all of your data in, a fi in, in files, you know, so it enables like the people like, you know, Google or, or, or some of the other cloud companies to come up with, you know, much uh, optimized or faster ways to, uh, or, or more compressed ways to store, their store the variants. Uh, 
uh, at the back end. Um, so we had a, you know, again, coming back to the driver project idea is that we, we did have uh, quite a good interoperability demonstration. You know, we had uh, clients and servers for this standard, uh, you know, from uh, some of the uh, uh, companies, DNA Nexus, um, we had Google Cloud Platform, we had the, uh, um, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, um, the European Genome Phenome Archive. We all put up different, developed different clients and servers and showed that we, 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 we all stored us the same data and showed that we could all talk to each other and actually uh, get the same answer when we, when we started talking across all these different clients and servers. So that was a really nice uh, demonstration of how we can actually show that the standard actually works and we actually get, you know, it, it really does interoperate across different infrastructures. Um, who's implemented this standard so far? There's a whole set of uh, uh, logos here from different uh, um, groups around the world, different companies, different academic groups, different software uh, uh, and tool, key kind of tool developers uh, who've impl implemented this standard. We want, you know, if you're serving genomic data, uh, if you want to be able to stream it, please, you know, join the, join the party here for this, uh, this uh, streaming standard. And thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Okay, thank you, Thomas. I realized when I came up before that I was quite rude and I didn't introduce myself. I am not Eric Dishman of the Alvis Research Program, who regretfully was unable to attend last minute, but I'm Stephanie Devani of the National Institutes of Health, also of the Alvis Research Program, um, and delighted to be here in this first conversation and hope to continue on with this group for many years. Um, so next, I am uh, delighted to introduce Dr. Laura Rodriguez, who I understand uh, is going to go rogue. And so I'm not clear that she's going to talk about informed consent or privacy, but for sure it will be interesting and helpful. In the policy realm, uh, Laura is from the National Human Genome Research Institute. So don't worry too much. I'm far too much of a rule follower to completely skip the topic. Um, but I do... Um, know as well that everyone in this room who works with your cohorts, you know about the informed consent and the privacy issues that are relevant to your cohort. Um, and I also did not want to be the negative part of the day where we talked about all the reasons why we couldn't put these wonderful things together. Um, so I wanted to shift the frame a bit and talk about some of the higher level issues where we can focus on the common goals and the common purposes that bring us together and think about how do we use those to work through some of the challenges that we might have. I'll also acknowledge that it is still complex and can feel a bit like a solid mass, and as you pull away some of the layers, it might sting and or make you want to cry, um, and that's okay. I think that if you're an Onion fan or a fan of the science, that this few minutes or days or weeks of working through these issues and really looking at them carefully can be well worth what the outcome is, which is to get to the really exciting science that is possible through the data and the information that you all have collected. So why don't we start again with a more positive frame of what do we know um, and what do we need to think about in terms of this. So we know that the risks of being a participant in a cohort study um, in any country, let alone when things come together in the way that we're, we're thinking about, those risks aren't static and they're not always quantifiable. We know that we need to respect the consent for any given individual, any given um, study parameters, um, but that's not going to be enough. Privacy, also we know it's not absolute, it can't be guaranteed, but protecting it is paramount. And therefore to do that, we also know that our data security procedures, while they won't be perfect a few minutes after they're set up, um, we need to make sure that they're responsive so that we can stay on top of them and make sure that they are as robust and as current as we can possibly make them. What we also know is that we have to accommodate differences, and there are differences at many different levels. Um, these are going to come in terms of the values of the individuals um, within a given study, but also with regard to their communities of the populations that participate in studies, and of course also just across our different countries. We need to think about how those differences might express themselves, whether it's values or whether it's risk tolerance for any particular trade-offs that they might be willing to make with regard to their values or their perspectives on privacy and how they think about their own personal privacy, how countries think about the privacy of their citizens, and of course then the cultures and what that brings to it. Again, whether it's about any of these individual issues or just in general, how do we think about genetics and our own genetic information um, within our countries or our communities. 
So I was in a meeting last week focused on building medical information commons, and we were talking a lot about trust. And it drove me back to the dictionary to think about how do we define trust. We've all talked about trust already today as being something that's important for participants in the research enterprise, in the specific study that they're participating in, and then in any of the activities that a study might contribute to. So the first definition in the list was something the way that I personally always looked at it, and I think I've, I've thought about it with regard to the scientific enterprise, and that's just a reliance on the character and trust that they are good um, and that I can have confidence in whatever it is I might be participating in or which I might be asking someone to participate in. But as I read further down, there was one that actually um, I thought was really interesting for the purposes of this conversation and in thinking about the research relationship between a study and its participants and how a participant might think about that with regard to how they're putting their faith in something and in fact trying to contribute to something where they're entrusting something valuable to them to be cared for by an entity, whether it's an individual or a study. And I think that's a useful way to think about this because of the connection to a relationship and something where there's a purpose and some kind of reciprocity that comes forward in terms of being part of the study. And I think that's something that we'll have to keep in mind as we think about combining our studies going forward. So to try to break trust down, again, I also need to acknowledge you can break trust down in many different ways. There are lots of interconnected issues. And so what I'm about to talk about is how I'm thinking about it today, probably for the rest of this week, but it might evolve as I learn new things. And we talk to everybody in thinking about this. So in terms of two key elements that I think are important to build and sustain trust, it would be transparency and risk management in terms of putting together systems to guide research programs and going forward, again, either as the program or as a collaboration. Going a little bit more specifically with regard to what we're talking about, transparency can be conveyed through our informed consent process, the governance systems that we set up, and the ongoing communications that we build in. And again, this doesn't have to be individually with a particular participant. We already heard today about the number of studies that have newsletters or other ways of communicating with the public, whether they're a participant or not, about the activities of the study, what's happening, how are their data being used, what might they get out of it if they participate, and these are all important to, again, maintaining the transparency that's gonna help us sustain trust. With regard to risk management, this is where more of the legal issues come in, and so we'll have privacy regulations, data security procedures, and regulatory oversight where we're looking at the studies as they go through, monitoring things that are happening, making sure that we're on top of them and responding to new factors as they arise. Again, there's a lot of interconnectedness between these issues. Within regulatory oversight, for instance, we've got informed consent documents which are different than the informed consent process that comes into play with transparency. But there is crosstalk between these two domains. So how can we think about going forward in this space? Um, one thing that I would posit is that we can look to existing frameworks that have already started to go forward. Using my own country as an example, one of the first things that came forward out of the Precision Medicine Initiative was an attempt to craft, actually it started as an, an attempt to craft standards for privacy. And what we quickly realized after talking to the stakeholders is that we could not create explicit standards. Um, and just by the way, too, wanted to point out that this did, um, is still the basis for how all of us is going forward and crafting their study procedures. Um, but the purpose that came out was a set of core values that could be used to sustain public trust again and maximize benefits of precision medicine. The expression of that were several core elements, and under each of these core elements were, again, a, a more granular set of principles as to how to achieve something that would be trustworthy in terms of any precision medicine initiative, whether it was the All of Us program or anything else that could go forward. As um, the last speaker talked a lot about, another really useful place for us to look to in this regard, because it does come from an international group of experts with the expertise in different countries, rules, regulations, and values, is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. They also created a framework, not a set of standards, but a framework for responsible sharing, where their purpose was very specifically to enable sharing of large genomic and health-related data sets so that the science could go forward in a responsible way. 
They began with stating four foundational principles, which I'm not sure that any one of us would disagree with, but which are expressed in different ways in our different countries, and use these principles to again identify several core elements as to how to put together the framework and think about achieving these issues. These are set forward as best practices, not as standards. Um, and can be very helpful for, again, identifying where there's consensus across different cultures um, and expertise, so the legal frameworks as well, is what we're trying to achieve um, in combining these large data sets and in working with the information to gain knowledge about health. So I will use my two assigned topics as case studies for how we can begin to think about these things. So with the, f the first one being informed consent, we all know that it's already overburdened. It can't possibly do any more. It's right now much more focused, at least the document, on the regulatory side of issues and the um, risk management rather than the transparency and trust building. So again, thinking about that higher level of what are the principles underlying them and where's the common goal that we're trying to get to, again, starting with my country and everyone will need to start with their own, um, we can look at what the, the policy goals are and the values. So from the um, former President's Bioethics Commission, there was a discussion about consent in genomics with the basic principles being understanding who has access to the information and how the information might be used. Also some discussion about preferences for that going forward. This of course has to be layered then with our laws and our legal framework, um, known affectionately or not as the common rule um, in the United States. And there's not necessarily a connection between those principles and value discussion and the legal framework that we're working with. And I imagine that that's probably true in other countries as well. Both of these need to be taken into account when we're thinking about how do we go forward in our cohorts, whether they're existing or whether they might start, or we have opportunities for new discussions with participants um, so that we can get to what we're trying um, to go for in terms of the larger goal. Again, going back to what the Global Alliance has created, they also have a consent policy, again, stating out basic principles of what should be there, but not stating how they would be or have to be expressed. And then these principles, which are based on those four foundational um, um, elements that were discussed in the framework, are followed up with best practices to give information on how might this be achieved, but not expecting that everyone do everything in the same way. They've also developed some tools that can be used to help um, think about how the common set of goals compared to what your specific situation might be. So there is information on how to look at legacy consents and think about how does this match with what our common values are. There's also some draft language if you um, find that you do need to or have the opportunity to go back and talk to participants about ongoing participation, your own country, like ours does, might have similar resources that you could look to for sample language and discussions about how to um, align existing consent um, with what would be appropriate for discussing um, collaborations at the international scale. And another thing I, that I think would be very useful for this group is a data sharing lexicon that the Global Alliance created so that as we're using the same words, we can understand exactly what we're talking about. Because many times, particularly in our legal documents, we've used the same terms with different meetings. And it's important to make sure that we're all on the same page. And this provides something that we can go back to and think about, or that we might need to develop on our own for the purposes of, of these cohorts coming together. OK, so the second case study would be privacy. Um, and so we know in an ideal scenario, we would be able to work with the data and discover everything that there is to be interrogated um, from use of the data without there being any risk to the privacy of the individuals. We know that that's not quite right. We need, at least right now, we need to lift the veil a bit, but need to do so in a way that doesn't completely expose the individuals and make the um, threshold for re-identifiability too substantial. Again, we would begin by looking at our own country's um, situations, but a, I think also looking to a place, at least as a starting point, for where there is international consensus on what some of the, the values might be. And the Global Alliance has looked at this um, 
been clear that while privacy is fundamental and yet not absolute, it's really about finding the balance between different considerations and different tensions of individual interests, community interests, and cultural interests at the society level, et cetera. So again, they have created a document which includes best practices, again, not specifying standards as to how to achieve things, but talking at a relatively granular level about what the requirements are or expectations might be and some ways that you might get to achieving them. And you can use these to look at how does the situation for your cohort compare with what some of the census might be to find those commonalities and hopefully then um, work towards identifying the solutions that can bring us all to that common point which is what we're here today and tomorrow to think about, is how can we bring the science, the policy, and the regulations together and think about what governance can guide these collaborations as it goes forward. We understand what the scientific opportunity is. Each of us have specific requirements already in place for these existing cohorts. We need to understand that and what the legal frameworks are. But then we have the opportunity to create the vision for how to collaborate, understand where the opportunities are, for this to achieve the common purpose and make sure that we're clear about where the responsibilities lie and how we're gonna maintain accountability within this. And the real goal is just to find work throughs to get to this point, not work arounds, but work throughs so that we can understand what's possible, accommodate what might be challenging and get to the goal of um, being able to do all of this great science. And I will stop there. Thank you, Laura. That was not terribly rogue and much appreciated. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Rob Califf, um, who is uh, also a former FDA commissioner in the US. And he's going to talk about quantitative science to optimize the value of cohort data. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Boy, St Steph, you scared the hell out of the previous two people. They did a tremendous job, stayed right on time. It was. Uh, this, this is going to be tough, and it's especially hard since, I, as most of you know, I'm not a data scientist. I'm a data science politician is the way I describe myself now. We started a center at Duke on data science, and it's called The Forge, just so in case you're wondering about these slides. And the reason is that when we sort of polled everybody on campus for words that would describe what was needed, the biggest thing that was needed was breaking down the, all the metal and steel and stuff that's encasing people and whatever they happen to be doing, creating a sweaty, hot environment where people come together, toil uh, all hours of the day and night, and work on data. So uh, that's what we're thinking about. And I was intrigued by the title about value, and it's, I've been sort of sitting here all day looking at people's different views of uh, what value is. I think the only thing that's out of bounds based on this discussion is uh, what my kids learned when I became a academic administrator and they looked up what academic meant and it meant of theoretical importance but of no practical significance. So <laughs> I think, you know, everything I've heard here today is people really striving to develop things that are actually useful to help people either achieve better health or make better policy decisions. And I've also been in this meeting feeling um, pretty excited and, I, I, you know, I'm going to maybe bore you but to me it's kind of fun. I got exposed to this first in the 1970s when we had a computerized database and it seemed so easy. We had this thing called bypass surgery and cardiology and you had medical treatment. This before aspirin was being routinely used and we could sit down with each patient and do informed decision making with a Cox model on the computer about what could be expected with one treatment versus the other. So my very first paper I wrote was predicting that within five years we would have uh, cohorts of data for almost every disease where doctors and patients could look at information together and make good choices. Well, I'm beginning to feel like finally we may be getting there after hearing uh, what you all have said today, but that's, it's still a ways off. I was off, I hope not by a century, but at least uh, off by decades. And that got me thinking as I was preparing this talk, and it's turned out to be this way. I think. Uh, what you all have presented today um, is an entry into the fourth industrial revolution. And I, we made up some fun slides that relate to the Ford. So I, just to remind you, um, I feel like we may uh, be now just like uh, people were 
right before the uh, water and steam power came about when people said we can just make humans work harder and uh, everything will happen. Or like the people uh, who uh, advise people like Henry Ford that horses can run faster, uh, we don't need cars and other uh, powered uh, elements. Or like uh, we were right before email. Many of us are old enough to remember that. And in fact, one of my great memories of uh, Rory and Richard was the great technological transformation that made it possible to do the first large trials, I think, was the fax machine. Because it enabled someone in some other country to send data over the fax machine instead of having to wait to have it delivered in a packet and then entered into a computer. And um, it was really a remarkable thing when we uh, first got, um, you know, sort of the current level of information technology. But what you all are talking about today is the beginning, I think, of this fourth industrial revolution where everything is becoming digital information. And, um, but we're obviously in a very rudimentary stage. And it's, it's been interesting to see the juxtaposition of very simple things like if you could just get the blood sugar down, that would be great, versus um, billions of base pairs being put into one equation to develop a risk score. And that's where I think uh, the politics of quantitative sciences really need to come into play. Because society has big uh, expectations. And I think the question is, how do we put together the right principles and the right groups of people to use the quantitative sciences to deliver something close to what society expects and to help others understand what the limitations are of what we can do quantitatively? This is a depiction I use every time I talk now about the history of biomedical science up until today. And I think it was uh, visionaries like Francis who realized that the only way to begin to look at the whole elephant was to put together very large teams of people working together across the different spheres of uh, information. And uh, as Jeff pointed out, the study I've been most involved in since getting out of the FDA is baseline. Just to give you an idea of the quantity of data, six terabytes in the first two days, everything about the electronic health record that we can handle. Everybody goes home with an Android, a watch, and a sleep sensor. Uh, I'm also participating in this. So the spouse may not be too happy about the sleep sensor from what I'm gathering um, at home. You wonder what that thing's collecting about both people. Um, <laughs> And then this, you know, the, the fastest growing area of data is the digital phenotyping arena because it was totally unapproachable until very recently. But it's an enormous amount of data upon which all sorts of things are being said, most of which are probably partially true, but the question is, are they true enough that you would actually uh, use it to make decisions? So I, I have three premises about this. The first is that the very more, most important thing is um, organizing, organizing and curating the information. And I can say for sure when it comes to gadgets and gimmicks, gimmicks that we wear, um, what's required for consumer information and what's needed for medical decision making in a way that most of us would be comfortable, very different. Um, large amounts of missing data, all sorts of noise. It's very approachable through um, uh, engineering and iterative improvement, but needs uh, the right team of people. So um, even with Dr. Keene's standards uh, in place, there's a lot of work to do just to deal with the data. And um, you know, I used to worry about using this term, um, janitor work, um, but you know, it is the most important work in most parts of Silicon Valley from what I've been able to tell. That is, there are plenty of people that can analyze data, and many of the analyses are getting more automated if you have people also understand the underlying assumptions. But if you have bad data, it's pretty hard to make sense of it. So it made my day when two weeks ago I got an email saying that for the first time at the International Conference on Pharmacoepidemiology, there's actually going to be a plenary session on data janitors to uh, form uh, a professional effort of people who are really dedicated to doing this work. And obviously a lot of room as the data gets more complex for quantitative science. It's not all uh, handwork, but it probably got to some of your attention that there's a company called Flatiron 
that uh, has been dealing with cancer data just got bought for $2.1 billion. Not bad for um, uh, a group of uh, academics and Googlers who started it. But the key to the value of that company was actually a room full of clinicians who were doing the final curation after automation of uh, the kind of electronic health record data that Josh was talking about. And so uh, getting the, the best data is point number one. And related to that, uh, the critical importance of provenance of being able to track uh, how the data gets changed and transformed, uh, having the right metadata, and then, of course, having uh, validation from external sources. Premise two is that we've got to get the right teams together, and I don't think we know the right teams for this modern um, era. And even in this meeting, I mean, it, it's kind of silly for me to be talking to you. You're the people who do it right by design, the people that were invited here. But as we begin to combine these very complex types of data, um, you need both the expertise and the type of data, the, the biological or clinical expertise, um, and the data science uh, together. And here I'd call uh, your attention to the course of the year I put together at University of Washington called Calling Bullshit, which is, um, was so popular that in three minutes the entire in-person seating was uh, filled up at University of Washington when it went up uh, on the internet. It took three minutes to fill the class. But their uh, lessons are on the internet. All the lectures are available. Uh, the two uh, founders of the course just came to NC State and gave a very interesting lecture about it. But what was fascinating to me is their lecture mostly would have been what I would have called clinical epi or epi 101. It was all about context, confounding, lead time, all the things that most of you take for granted, but people with an in, a background in engineering or gadgets or Silicon Valley um, may not have had any experience with, and as I've learned in my time in Silicon Valley, often take for granted that they can uh, analyze their way out of it, and I actually don't think that's possible to do. So the question is, how do we take all this data and uh, boil it down to something that's useful to people. And here, at least in our center, uh, we've decided to get very focused um, on everyone understanding that probably asking the right question with the right data is more important than anything else that you can do. This is nothing new to you all, but with the proliferation of automation, uh, the number of people who will make claims related to large amounts of data that looks impressive just because it's a lot of data, um, uh, I think will, will, uh, should make us very uh, concerned. And then we have this uh, really vexing question in the quantitative arena, what is a data scientist? And I've now seen about 10 variations of the Venn diagram. This is the one that I like the best. Um, I end up in meetings where people who do machine learning say you're not a data scientist if you're a biostatistician. And um, I don't think that's the case. But I think the main point of this one is that data science is not just about analyzing the data. It has, has a lot of other components. And a big one that's showing up now is communication. And I want to talk a bit uh, more about that. So um, my main point here is that um, the quantitative methods are not up to the quantitative methodologist. It's really uh, an issue of getting the right teams together and having the right culture so that people are sharing what they know. It made my day when Seth uh, gave his talk and made the key point, and this is an error that we see over and over. I know the genetics field has gotten into the, you know, it's totally accepted that you must validate your findings, but this is not so in many other areas that are dealing with these complex kinds of data. And certainly speaking from the point of view of the FDA, um, this issue of, uh, nailing something down and then validating it um, so that you're not making up as you go is really critically important. And as you know, we're now in an era where there are many people advertising their algorithms on the internet for sale, very hard to um, regulate. And furthermore, as you get into quantitative methods like machine learning applied to the kind of data that you all are talking about, where the algorithms are not fixed, no one knows exactly how to make sure that when people make claims about what their uh, algorithms can do for clinical decision-making that they're actually correct. 
Um, and I think this is an area that we all need to be thinking hard about while we're doing the fundamental epidemiology, the question of how do we translate uh, those findings into something that actually is giving you the correct uh, decision. And then uh, the last is that this field, I think, has to step up in its approach to translating findings into truthful and understandable uh, information. And I think ethics is best presented um, as principles that need to be applied to particular cases in different ways. But it's also fair, I think, to say that um, the public is besieged with data and plots and graphics that look alluring and often are quite inaccurate, which is one of the points that um, the Calling Bullshit course gives an, uh, a real uh, education in. And one thing I've learned in the Google environment is that I can assure you that for every question someone has about health or health care, there's an answer on the internet. And the problem that we have is that answers that are totally fabricated are easier to accept and look better and have much less uncertainty than anything that's a scientific answer because if the right quantitative methods are applied, there's always uncertainty and there always should be caveats. Uh, Rory has a great lecture about this related to statins and the increase in mortality that occurs when another sort of crazy claim comes out about the bad things that statins do and people stop taking their statins. So a brilliant analysis that isn't understood has limited value. And of course, uh, this is really should be top of mind now because of what's uh, happened with uh, Facebook, which is related to pretty sophisticated analytics to applied to micro-targeting of people, which is, of course, going on every day uh, through advertising. And increasingly, not just advertising related to politics or buying shoes, but advertising related to healthcare products and something that we need to be concerned about. And um, there's been a theory um, with some empirical evidence that fake news uh, is louder than the truth. And I've articulated some theoretical reasons why that would be the case, but you probably all saw that last week there was some really good empirical evidence of this uh, directly from the Internet showing that uh, fake rumors um, travel further. That is, they go to more people, they last longer, and they go deeper. Uh, than uh, true uh, stories. And so um, as a scientist, as we apply quantitative methods, we've got to think about how we can combat what is a natural human tendency to believe things that make sense and are displayed in a way that's convincing without the kind of uncertainties that we're obligated to um, say when we give scientific facts. And sort of related to this is that um, as we put our teams and systems together, as things get more complicated, uh, because of the multiple chances for error and the difficulty of checking, uh, we need to think really carefully about the systems to catch the holes in the Swiss cheese that will inevitably occur. This comes up at the FDA where people have for a long time said you shouldn't regulate decision support because it's just an algorithm. And I've always argued that we probably shouldn't now, and in fact that's FDA policy. But we will find, as people use it more and more, that uh, bad advice by decision support could be as harmful as any medical product you could imagine. So as we develop this, we need to also be thinking carefully about the societal implications. Um, sharing is obviously important. I'll skip over that. And then my last couple of slides are just, um, as I look at, uh, Francis referred to this, but as I've learned about the universe in Silicon Valley, I think Rory also referred to it, um, we live in a sort of strange medical world where we say um, doing, a, doing randomization is some weird thing that we have to you know, go to great lengths to deal with and add all this other stuff to it. Whereas in business, randomization is just the way that you do business. It's how you figure out the next good business move. And I was actually fascinated to learn that in um, veterinary medicine and agriculture, one of the biggest businesses in the U.S. are veterinarians who do cluster randomized trials on farms. And they, they never publish because they just do it as a business because that's how you decide on the farm the best way to deal with uh, everything from diseases to what you feed uh, the animals. But somehow, in something so much more important, we rarely randomize, which I think is a big, uh, a big mistake. 
And then finally, this question for quantitative teams, how big should they be? Is sharing um, data, meaning you send, someone logs on and does their own analysis, or is there a way that we work together through collective intelligence, which is certainly the way a lot of, lot of other fields are evolving. And, and I'll close with the final two slides quickly. Um, there's a thing uh, at FDA which is really, really critical and I think pertinent to what I've said. Um, the the uh, legal standard for advertising, whether you like it, advertising for drugs or not, most people don't in the medical profession, but there's a thing called the First Amendment in the United States, for better or worse. Um, it's truthful and not misleading. And the truthful part is pretty straightforward. You can usually figure that out. But the not misleading part is really hard because you can 100% tell the truth, but if you leave out other parts of the story, you can be very misleading. And I think as we get into more complex data and more complex aggregations of large populations, there's a tremendous uh, risk here. So I would conclude just by saying just uh, ethics is too important to leave to ethicists. We all need to work on it. Data science is too important to leave to data scientists. Uh, we need all the different types at the table working together and looking transparently at each other's work. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and welcome back, Stephanie. Uh, so we have about 25 minutes for, for discussion. Um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll start uh, just uh, since, Rob, in particular, you emphasized uh, teamwork uh, at several points in your talk, but also Thomas and Laura also talked about bringing together lots of different kinds of people to help build data infrastructure or, 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 or policy. So I'm just... Uh, wondering if you could comment on the incentives for the kind of teamwork that's going to be necessary to make this happen, since that seems to be at the crux of a lot of the things we're talking about today is how do we get cohorts from around the world to begin to actually think about how to participate with one another. Can you comment on the secret sauce to making this work or success? <laughs> I, I mean, I think this is almost completely a problem of academia and the traditions of academia, um, and um, it's interesting to see when there's a co common business interest how people's uh, egos are not in play. And I'd, I'd also comment, when people ask me about the federal government, um, at least at, I can't speak for NIH, but at FDA, the ego is very subjugated. I mean, people are there for a mission, and yeah. one of my biggest problems was getting people to want to take credit for the work that they do because they were part of a team with a public health mission. But I think the academic thing, from what I'm seeing, having now that I'm back out on the street, is still a tremendous problem. And um, if we don't figure out how to deal with it, it's going to continue to slow us down. I, I, let me add one other thing. As we get into the more, the, the areas that we talk about where you need the clinician and the person, because you're, you may be actively intervening as part of the system of learning, um, uh, finding credit for people who help other people get their research done <coughs> is uh, so important, and it's a bigger problem in the U.S. than the rest of the world. There's a reason they're worrying Richard do all their trials outside of the U.S. as much as they can. Do you, have a, uh, you got a microphone? I think it goes beyond individuals and in academia, uh, but just uh, to essentially maintain a cohort does require continued funding. And if we've, we've done this within the context of NIH, which means you have to come up for uh, review and funding every five years, and you have to show what your publications are and impact and all of that. So uh, it, it, I, th I think that does create a, a challenge uh, that if we're going to have a coalition of cohorts, uh, collaboration, <coughs> it, uh, we first have to think of keeping the cohorts alive and well. and. Uh, within the NIH context, as it is up until this point, it does uh, mean that uh, not necessarily the individuals, but the cohorts have to be credited and uh, interviewed and funded. I think Rory has. Okay, Rory, and then I'd also love to hear, and, and maybe Rory can speak to the UK situation, but I'd love to hear from some other countries about the incentive models there, because I think the US might be somewhat unique. Uh, 
it, it may be off, off a different topic, but I, I wanted to ask Laura perhaps to expand on the, the issue of fear of risk <coughs> versus real risk um, with regard to the way in which these cohorts are used. So I mean, taking a couple of examples from UK Biobank, when we first made the data available, um, there was a lot of fear that it would be abused. Um, and so we were requiring people to give very, very specific uh, proposals about hypothesis testing. And then the genetic data came along and it became kind of impractical uh, and not really sensible because it was about hypothesis generating and we kind of op opened it up much more. But we still say, well, if you're gonna do anything more than you told us you were gonna do, you need to tell us. And I think, I, mean, I, I guess the question is, why? Um, why are we saying that? Uh, and is it just uh, a fear of, of a not real risk? A and uh, another example is we have consent from participants to get access to the health record data. But as um, uh, Kathy pointed out, we only have the primary care data for half of the participants. Not because the participants have said they don't want it, but because the primary care doctors or at least the controllers of the primary care doctors say, well, the, what about the risks? Uh, and then you think, well, what risks? Uh, and and, and I, I think that you know, we're, we're too, in a way we're too fearful um, and uh, it would be helpful to kind of air uh, that issue. Um, too much risk averseness is actually adverse um, in terms of its impact on public health as well, I think. So I guess I would just say that there's not a neat and clean answer for that and just acknowledge that. I think one of the things we do need to do is acknowledge that there is fear out there. We also need to acknowledge that a lot of that fear might be coming from us, which gets to your point of our response of, of trying to mediate that perceived fear in the public with very specific interactions that then lock us into things and, and make it easier for human error to happen that doesn't actually contradict the purpose or consent of data, but now you haven't exactly followed this very specific path we've asked you to follow, and so there's a problem. Um, so I think we do need to, it's part of it is, is engaging with the public and understanding, not in a comprehensive way, but in a general way, where is the public and your study population actually thinking, or actually feeling on these issues, and, and where are trade-offs that they would be willing to have <coughs> in exchange for participating in the study. Um, and if we understand that maybe at a more quantitative level than we can actually classify the risk, we might be able to develop some different solutions for how to work through those concerns, both on our side and on their side. We still have to keep in mind that everybody's different and we're gonna have to have a system that can both scale um, and respect differences, and so now there are some technologies coming into play we might be able to use to allow those kind of preferences to be there, or there's some study design issues that we can make choices about um, to be upfront and transparent about this is what's gonna happen. If, if you personally don't like this, then it, this isn't the study for you, and it might take longer to recruit people, but it's, I, at least in my opinion, more respectful of the fact that we can't make promises everywhere, and, and we do wanna balance that potential for scientific advancement and public benefit with all of the concerns that any one of us could name about everything that could go wrong, um, even if it's a slight possibility. Um, I think the other concern you mentioned, and I don't know if this is necessarily for me, again, it's a common problem is, is when the docs don't want to share information because they're concerned about what the patients might do or not do with the information. Um, is that right? Well, it's not so much that, it's that they, they're fearful that if they share it, they're not allowed to share it. They overinterpret uh, the, the rules. And uh, I mean, another example would be, you, we get consent for access to health-related records. We find out someone's got cancer. Is their tumor sample a health-related record? Uh, yes or no? Uh, according to the NHS, yes. but then there's fear about, well, but would the participants have understood that a tumor sample is, according to the NHS regulations, a record? And would they care? I mean, so, so 
you one takes this risk-averse approach and stops oneself from doing things that I think actually reasonably one would do. Um, and, and, and that was really the, the issue. Are we stopping ourselves from doing things that, that really um, uh, are not in the public interest? So I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, I, the, the actual answer is harder to get to and it takes a lot of time to understand it because first we have to actually understand how to go for it. I think models like all of us now where we have participants part taking part in some of these early discussions and are creating this governance, it's also where governance comes in so that if you have a transparent process, as changes come up and you need to understand what people might think, if it's not just academicians and the scientists making decisions on behalf of the participants, I think there's a way to, to get greater credibility. And even if we made a mistake, there's at least credibility to the process. And I think so that that, that might help more with the trustworthiness and, and the willingness to, to adapt and to own maybe misjudgments and continue to move forward in the public good, being always very clear about what what the goals are and the public good that we're trying to get from that. Again, it's not a nice, neat answer. It, answer, it's not easy and it's also not very discreet, but it's a process going forward to try to get us where we wanna go. And, and certainly, Rory, in, in the US, we have regulations that have a certain intent and then there's the institutional interpretation of those regulations and we are dealing with this with the All of Us Research Program all the time. I mean, our goal, um, with all of us is to start to get the participant in the mix and so that's it's participant mediated and and sort of take some of the ownership there away from the institutions who might interpret the regulations a little differently than we intend for them to Francis so I'm gonna ask Rory another question more more practical one we've spent a lot of time with all of us worrying about data breaches and setting up security systems to try to minimize that and carrying out hackathons and having all kinds of other ways of assessing whether penetration of the database is a real risk. You've been doing this already with data that includes genotypes that might potentially be possible to use if somebody was really determined uh, to identify who those people are. Have you had any data breaches, any concerns maybe we could learn from? Not that we're aware of, and we've certainly done all of those those kind of uh, um, penetration tests and things like that. But again, it goes back to my question. I mean, you espouse data sharing. So why are we preventing it by stopping people from breaching the data? Um, I mean, that is a serious question. I mean, you, we were doing this deliberately. We were actually having access processes that made it difficult for people to put in applications to use the data in the way that actually participants had consented to. Um, which was to, to, to use it for health-related research. We were saying, you have to be very specific. Then we kind of shifted it. But um, you, if, we ha if we can anonymize the data reason you, as, as well as we possibly can, which I think was the, the phrasing used, then should we be kind of more open rather than less open? Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that's what we're doing. I'm just saying that it is fear of risk actually uh, causing... Um, the data not to be used as widely and as effectively in the interests of public health. Or, or our perception of people's fear of risk. A lot of people aren't uh, afraid of these things at all. They just want their data used in research is my perspective. Yeah, but yeah. you know, it's going to get worse with, uh, I think, in terms of people reacting to the Facebook stuff right. in ways that perhaps is not appropriate to the kinds of data that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, it could, it could. Um, Matt, and then I'd love to hear from some of the other countries represented. So, um, <coughs> You mentioned culture. There, there is a risk that I think we're not mentioning yet, and that's the risk of unfairly labeling uh, communities. Um, and so this is not so much about uh, the Western idea of individuality, but about individuals being part of larger communities. So in the US, American Indians have had the experience of having um, <coughs> genetic analyses done that uh, interfere or tend to overturn their own uh, uh, um, stories of ancestry, and that is very upsetting to the community. So I think we have to be cognizant of interpretations of data when we data share that harm communities as well as individuals. Do you want to get back to incentives? Yeah. 
Yeah, any, any uh, uh, perspectives from countries that do not begin with a U uh, on uh, the incentives around um, building teams or even this conversation we were just having about risk and how, how the participants in your countries feel about data sharing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I was going to see, see your driver's license, but. <laughs> right, yes, we, we seceded last week. Uh, you know, uh, but if so, I saw no other hands, so I was going to shift the question a little bit. But if there's somebody from another country who wants to respond, please do. Camilla, did you want to come? So uh, I'm from Sweden, and I would say that, and I'm an oncologist uh, by training, uh, I would say that many people are very, very careful about data protection issues when they are healthy, hmm. but when you get the disease, you actually want to share all your data. Yes. And I think that yeah. we as a community and also the patient organizations in Sweden, they should deliver this message so that you actually get more open-minded in terms of data protection and sharing of data. And, um, and uh, I think we have a lot of regulations, but many of them are possible to succumb if it's a good project and if you can uh, tell the IRB committee uh, and explain and then you can get exemptions also from the Swedish law as mm -hmm. it is, uh, but you have to be very persistent as a researcher. Yeah. Something. Well, coming from Norway, I, I have a slightly different perspective. I think uh, to create cohorts, large population-based cohorts, is basically something that the government should feel responsible for in order to develop s sustainable health systems for the future. There should be a lot more science and research driving that forward. So whether they run them as governmental organizations or not, that's not the issue. The issue is that these are huge infrastructures mm -hmm. that governments should feel responsible for developing. It's good that a lot of us have been able to develop uh, such, uh, uh, such cohorts on our own without actually having the organizations or the funding or anything but enthusiasm to come as far as we have come. But I think it's impossible to uh, sort of bring all these initiatives together without having uh, a much broader perspective on this as an infrastructure. You would never develop yeah. transportation systems in countries the way we have developed cohorts. You wouldn't leave it to single individuals in academic institutions to sort of uh, develop something as immense as this sh hopefully will be. So I, I think that the funding organizations and those of us who are here and who see this as infrastructures, we should point out how can it developed into that phase and then uh, the, the data should of course be shared and made available but it would be a completely different situation. It would be more like having uh, a road system or something that we can use for all kinds of different purposes whether it's for industry or research or for fun. But I, I think we have to shift into that kind of thinking and also, I think that the way we have to deal with ethics and all the requirements that are put upon us now means that we end up being incredibly defensive because science is necessary yeah. uh, to run these systems and it's an obligation for the health system to do science, both discovery-oriented science and science in order to sort of do the data, more trivial science to do the day-to-day -day running of health systems. And if we don't do it, it's incredibly irresponsible. And it, it, it's too expensive and it's risky. So we are not weighing those risks against those, uh, in my view, relatively hypothetical 
hypothetical risks that are involved in biobanking or cohorts or registries compared to the risks that people are taking all the time, whether they know it or not, just by being patients in the healthcare system. So I'll stop there. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Next time she gets her own talk. <laughs> There's a gentleman in the back that wants to. Yeah. Uh, uh, who? Mark. Marcel Goldberg from France oh, and uh, Constance Project. In fact, we do not know exactly what people f uh, think about sharing data. What we can say is that what, you, what we see when uh, people are enrolled, we warn them that their data would be used for by other researchers, can be used by, for, by pr private companies, can be used in sharing data in a European consortium and so on. So people are warned that. And then, for each project, we have dozens of projects now running in Constance. For each project, we, uh, the French regulation imposes that people are, um, uh, that, that we have to, to, to tell to people which project and they can oppose. So we do inform individually each, pro, uh, for, uh, each participant of all the project, saying which what kind of data would be used by this researcher, and they can oppose. And we have n never had any opposition. So, so it's an indirect way uh, of uh, looking. People who really who are participating want to share the data. I mean, there is no opposition. But we can say that sometimes they, 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 they are fe fearing about risk. For instance, we had the project on mobile phones in the, uh, nested into the cohort, and uh, the, the protocol um, says that uh, the operator will give connection data, and the rate of participation to that project is much lower to the, any other. So, so indirectly, we can see that people want to share the data, but they, they are uh, cautious about what could happen with that. Anders? <clears throat> Anders Messer from Estonian and Biobank. So we, uh, I really agree with uh, previous talks. We have been doing like 18 years biobanking in Estonia and people are really familiar. And now like five years ago, five days ago, I announced that we are going to increase biobank by 100,000 people and genotypes them all. By this morning, we had 22,000 uh, people already signed informed consent digitally. And government is supporting it now is that uh, in biobanking law, it says that government uh, pays for maintenance of biobank. So we get uh, extra money just to increase the biobank. We have to fight for money for doing research. But there is no problem anymore that there is no liquid nitrogen or, or some other stuff. But uh, coming to ethics, you know, I see that People really are not so much worried than uh, ethical uh, committee. We, last time we had a question that ethics uh, committee was asking question, how do you be sure that if people are reading this information, they really do understand? So this is really hard to answer. Uh, could we ask, uh, what should, how should we do it? Is it you just run a uh, test or ask a certificate from gymnasium or whatever? So you read a page of Estonian text or Russian text, and, and then ethical committee asking, how do you show us that they really understood it? So I guess it's not protecting any more than people. If it, always this is voluntary thing, if you don't want to be part of it or you don't understand, you can always call, you can come to get the counseling. But I think that uh, we are, uh, people are moved, in, at least in our case, I guess people are more, uh, familiar with, with risks and their own lives than uh, ethics committee protecting them too much, I would say. Mm -hmm. This is my uh, comment. So it's clear that we have a lot to learn from each other in, in this domain as well as many others. Um, we have time for one more uh, question, Mark. Maybe from the country of rural America. Okay. Uh, All right. In, oh, he's not from the UK. <laughs> Maybe. In relation to the to the last comment, I, I I'm always uh, amused by um, the Marshfield Personalized Medicine Program, which is actually one of the longest um, 
personalized medicine programs in the country. They've been in operation for over 20 years. And uh, they had initially been consenting their participants for every single study that was being done. And eventually the uh, participants marched into the IRB and said, enough already. Uh, you know, we have a certain amount of trust and we're, you're annoying us, you're harassing us with all this. So stop, you know, protecting us based on what you think. And, and as I reflected earlier, this is a lot of what our uh, members think as well. And I think in some ways we, we tend to think about the risks of these research data as being somehow different from all of the data that's available on all of us as part of the transactional um, uh, health record. Um, you know, that's, we're using the same protections, if not even additional protections over and above what our health record data is protected. And there's way more information in there uh, than in these research databases in most cases. And so I think in some ways we elevate the theoretical risk uh, much above the realistic risk. And we also imbalance the benefit with the risk. Yeah. And so we, you know, we, if I went to our IRB, in fact, we went to our IRB and said, we have people with um, pathogenic variants in BRCA1 and 2 and for Lynch syndrome and for FH. You know, these are CDC <laughs> tier 1 conditions. Um, what would your thoughts be if we were to randomize patients into return versus not returning? And they're saying, we don't think that's ethical because we, we know what to do with that information. You're obtaining it in a different way than we've done traditionally, but if the variant is real, I think we have to act on that. And I think that's what our patients reflect as well. So I, trying to make sure that we're not discounting the benefits and elevating the harms is really important. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, uh, uh, Rob, Thomas, and Laura for a great session, and Stephanie for being a great uh, co-chair.